Hey, I'm Austin Meyer, the X-Plane Guy, and today I'm going to talk about a component of modern airliners that makes their performance possible. But here's the interesting thing. This is a component that has no moving parts. You stare right at many, many times, and you might have no idea how useful it is. And really, from looking at it, how it could do anything at all. That component is the air inlet, the inside of this engine to sell here. So when I would look at these inlets when I was a little kid, I would say, well, hold on. This is just a tunnel to lead from point A to point B. The air couldn't possibly change moving through that hollow tunnel. So what's the point of this big lip around the inlet here? Is it to keep the baggage handlers from accidentally putting something like their arm into the compressor? Is it an attempt to keep the birds out of there somehow? Why do they even have it? Well, I've since learned why they have it, and boy, is it important. All right, let's start in understanding an inlet by looking at the game space here. The heart of the whole propulsion system is obviously the jet engine. The front stage of this jet engine, or the fan, is sometimes referred to as the low-pressure compressor. Now, hold that thought in your mind for a minute. We call the fan a compressor. Why do we call it a compressor? Obviously, it compresses the air to spit it out the back. All right, it takes a lot of work to compress that air. Is there any way we could get any sort of help with compression? Well, let's turn to Bernoulli. Bernoulli's law is all about compressing and expanding air. As air runs down a wide tube with a large area and then next down to a smaller tube, it speeds up. That's Bernoulli's law, and here's how you can visualize it. If you have a highway that is five lanes of traffic wide, and those five lanes neck down into one lane, well, if cars are going 20 miles an hour in the five lane section, they got to speed up to 100 miles an hour in the one lane section just to keep the same number of cars coming through. Well, the same number of atoms have got to pop out the back end as came in the front. So when air moves through into the thinner tube, it's going to speed up. But here's a cool little thing that Bernoulli discovered. When that air speeds up, it also generates a suction. You can think of the air as causing a suction that's pulling this fluid up. This is fluid in the little tube. And as the air speeds up and there's that suction, it's going... And it's lifting the fluid up in that low pressure region that comes with high speed flow. This is why wings work, by the way. The air speeds up over the top of the wing due to the curvature of the wing. That goes to a lower pressure, just like you see here in this tube, and that lifts up the airplane. So Bernoulli is literally what makes airplane wings lift. The problem is, that's completely useless to a jet engine. We don't want air to come in at a lower pressure and a higher speed. The high speed would just have our, our tips going up to the speed of sound, and the low pressure would just be undoing the work that the fan tries to do to compress the air. Going to a high speed and a low pressure is the exact opposite of what we want the air to do when it hits the fan. But what if we could flip it around backwards? Let's take Bernoulli's law, turn it on its ear. What if we go from a narrow tube to a wide one? And I can tell you, that's what this is. You can see this inlet goes to a wider section as the air moves aft. You can see you've got a certain area here, and look how the fan blades are like hidden back in there. It's like goes up to this big cavernous diverging duct. There's more area back here at the fan than there is at the inlet. The air is spreading out in that inlet. It's that Bernoulli thing I was telling you about, but backwards. Let's see what the air does. The air might be speeding along quickly as it enters the inlet. And if this is the inlet, this diverging duct, then on the other side, where the air hits the fan, it's going to be a lower speed and a higher pressure. And you can see it in this tube as it pushes that fluid down. <laughs> High pressure pushing the fluid down. Now let's think what that does for the compressor. If the air hits this compressor now, at a higher pressure, because it's been slowed down, that's doing some of the compressor's work for it. The fan's getting its work done for it by the inlet. Another benefit is, going slower at a higher pressure, that low speed means you can turn the fan 
even faster without having the prop tips here or the fan tips break the speed of sound and lose efficiency. So what the inlet does is it diverges into a wider cross section like this diagram shows that slows the air down to keep the fan subsonic and pressurizes it to do the first bit of work for the fan. And so that is why inlets are so cool. With no moving parts, they do the work of the compressor and slow the air down so it can be worked on further by the compressor. Now, you could stop watching here, but why don't we kick it up a notch? I'm going to show you the math. This is Bernoulli's law. Imagine everything on the left side of the equal sign is the air outside of the inlet, and everything on the right side of the equal sign is the air deep inside the inlet. What we say is velocity squared divided by 2 plus, plus pressure divided by air density outside the inlet is equal to velocity squared over 2 plus pressure over air density deep inside the inlet. Pause the video if you want to look at this equation while you ask yourself the question, if the inlet slows the air down, what's going to happen to the pressure to keep the equation balanced? All right, you've just unpaused the video if you've thought it through. When the air comes into the inlet, it slows down due to the diverging duct. As the air slows down, this term becomes smaller. The only way the equation is still going to balance, and this is Bernoulli's law, it will be balanced. The only way this equation is to be balanced is if the pressure comes up. In other words, this is the mathematical proof that slowing the air down to a lower velocity must increase the pressure. And that's why when this tube goes to a wider section and a lower speed, it also goes to a higher pressure. Now here's where this really gets cool. This is the square law. Remember the square law. If you double the input, you quadruple the output. You triple the input, you multiply the output by 9. This velocity is a squared term. If you double the velocity, you quadruple this ram air effect. If you multiply the velocity by 3, you multiply your ram air effect by 9. Multiply your velocity by 5, multiply your ram air effect by 25. And so what that means is as the speed builds up, the reduction from here to here in speed is going to become tremendous because of this square law. And so the pressure, the ram air effect, is going to go up through the roof. Now here is where this finally gives us the benefit. You already know in a car, let's say you take a car onto an on-ramp and you hit the gas and you've got a limited amount of horsepower in this car, okay? Your acceleration is initially pretty strong, but the greater the, the car's speed, the lower the acceleration. And this is neglecting atmospheric drag and all that. Forget about all that, okay? This is negligible at 60 or 70 miles an hour anyway. When you hit that gas, as the car builds up speed, the acceleration bleeds off for a given constant power. Why is that? Well, the answer is that force equals power divided by velocity. If you go twice as fast for a given power, you're only going to get half the force. You feel this in your car. If you're going twice as fast on that on-ramp for a given horsepower, you're only going to have half the acceleration. You'll probably have half the acceleration at 60 miles an hour that you had at 30 miles an hour. You can see the graph of this here. As the speed builds, the acceleration comes down. Or, put another way, as the velocity builds for a constant power, the force comes down. As the car speeds up, the acceleration bleeds off. Wah, wah. Here's the thing nobody tells you. The same thing happens to jet engines. No matter what you say about jet engines, this compressor still only has a limited amount of horsepower. It might be 100,000 horsepower, but it's still a limited amount of power. And so as a jet engine speeds up with a constant power available from the compressor, the thrust will deteriorate as the airplane speeds up. It's going to look like this, less thrust as the airplane speeds up because the velocity is increasing for a constant power that's less resultant force, less resultant thrust. Maybe you don't want to believe that. Well, take a look at the thrust curve here for the CFM-56 and the Boeing 737 airliner. On the vertical axis, we have thrust. On the horizontal axis, we have Mach number. This is Mach 0. You're stopped on the runway. And this is Mach 1. You're up over red line. Clearly, we don't get quite to Mach 1 for this experiment. 
Each curve is for a different N1 setting. Okay, so I've done 105% N1 in red, but let's look at 100% N1. I'm gonna do that one in orange. Now let's do 95. That has a nice big curve we can look at. So here I am at the 95% N1. And what you see is at low speed, you've got a certain amount of thrust, a little over 22,000 pounds. And as the speed builds up, look at that thrust just deteriorate. Wah, wah. The thrust is coming down exactly like this curve predicts. Constant power, increasing velocity means lower force. So indeed, the 737 puts out less and less thrust the faster it goes for the same reason your car does. Constant power divided by increasing velocity results in diminishing thrust. But unlike your car, the air inlet of the mighty CFM 56 engine is ready to play the secret trick. Ram air. As that velocity difference comes up, the pressure difference comes up. The pressure, as you see pushing down the fluid, starts to do the work of the compressor and coming up above about, oh, it looks like Mach 0.55, maybe Mach 0.6, that ram air effect, which I've proven here with Bernoulli, that ram air effect starts pressurizing the inlet and given oh so much more pressure to the engine. And that ram air effect allows the engine to recover the loss from speeding up until once you get fast enough, you can actually recover the vast majority of the thrust that you lost from going faster. And this is why a jet engine can give you all of this speed almost for free. Even though this equation says that the force is gonna deteriorate as the velocity builds, this equation, the ram air effect, which you add on top of that, starts pressurizing or turbocharging the engine to build up more thrust. Now, a little note here, the poor little Cirrus jet with its fat tubby little body and fat wing and tiny little compressor, it doesn't have the juice to go any faster than about Mach 0.5, so it operates right here. It can't build up enough speed to get the benefit of the extra speed. <laughs> so that little guy operates at the worst possible point in the thrust curve. But any properly designed jet with a small frontal area and a swept wing and low drag and big compressor can build up enough speed to come out the other side of this where the ram air effect starts overcoming the thrust deterioration effect with speed. So, the air inlet is what makes this upslope part of the curve possible and pushes you up to Mach 0.75, Mach 0.8, and of course for some biz jets, Mach 0.9. So the inlet is a pretty cool little piece of hardware. Now, I wonder what's next.